Okay, Mia, tell me your name and what you had for breakfast. My name is Mia, and I have not had breakfast. I just climbed out of bed. <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> what time is it? It's 7.20. All right, so Mia, you and I are in Annapolis, and it's kind of like old times, doing boat work on Falcon, having Micah over last night. Lee was here doing the engine stuff. How does it feel to be back hands-on working on the boat? It feels like we haven't learned anything. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean? We are still doing the same thing. <laughs> no, I think it's great. It's really fun to be able to, you and me, be able, be able to do boat work together. I, despite it, I actually love working on the boats with you. It's fun. T- uh, can you describe what you were actually doing last night in the lazarette? Because I'm not sure that's actually fun. The, the, the concept is fun, but what were you actually doing last night? Well, yeah, I was a pretzel in the, in the lazarette trying to remove some nuts from some pad ice that was mounted all the way aft on the deck. So I was laying in the pit sweating. Yeah, so the physical thing is not fun. It's like anything, exercise, it may not be fun in the actual moment, but it's very rewarding. Yeah, I agree. So we got uh, a couple more days of maintenance, and then I'm off to Lunenburg next weekend, and you and Axel are off back to Sweden. You haven't been home since April. How um, Have you even allowed yourself to think yet that you're going to be home in one week from tomorrow? No, I'm trying to enjoy the moment because uh, we are in the U.S. hanging with all the friends here, So, and I'm really going to be nice to go home, but it's also really fun to be here. And Annapolis is kind of our home. We know so many people here. You haven't been on the podcast since your seventh transatlantic, so just give us the the a quick a quick um, not a recap, but how how did it feel to be back at sea? This was by far the longest you've been away from home since Axel was born, and the longest you've been on the boat. So how did that feel? Well, I think the first uh, I flew down to Las Palmas and met up with Adam, and I think I shared the impression that a lot of crew share on Falcon. When I first came down to her, I was a bit overwhelmed because she looks like a big boat. She's a big boat. But uh, I was a bit overwhelmed when I first stepped on her and said, oh, man, she is big. Like, what have we done? <laughs> yeah. But then as soon as you like live on her and like spend time on her just for a day or two, she shrink in a, in a good way. And uh, she's just a sailing boat. Uh, but the, the trip was amazing. Sailed with uh, Chris for the first time, which was great. Had amazing crew both trips. We always have amazing crew, but it was really fun. And uh, light wind which was would have been nice to have a few extra knots, but uh, surprisingly we had no squalls. It was almost like, yeah, too, too easy. But uh, it was a great trip, a little bit slower than I think we all wanted, but you, that's the weather for you. Yeah. Um, we'd, uh, we had an open house here in Annapolis like two weeks ago, and you and I commented on how cool it was to be like, Annapolis really feels like our adopted spiritual home port, even though we don't live here anymore. Um, we're doing another one next week because we had such a good turnout. So we had like... What do you think? We had 50 people on the boat at City Dock? I think it was 50, 60, 70 at least because I'm sure not everyone came there as we started. Yeah, true. So if you missed that one, uh, we're doing another one one week from today. That would be June 29th, Thursday. That's going to be Thursday, 4 to 6 p.m. It's on the website. It's going to be in Spa Creek at South Annapolis Yacht Center. So you can show up and get to our Falcon. And James the Sailor Man... Uh, from YouTube, who's been on the podcast, he is going to be there as well because he is sailing with me to Greenland later this summer. So he's going to be in town and we'll do a little meetup with James and a tour of Falcon. So if you missed the first one, that is Thursday, June 29th at South Annapolis Yacht Center, 4 to 6 p.m. Mia, you're going to be, well, jet lagged. <laughs> yes, I'll be home by then. But I'll be here with James and uh, Ben Sufer, our mate, and Shia, our next apprentice, is going to be around for that. So we will see you then. Mia, um, anything else to add before we sign off here and start this week's show no it's just to thank everyone for coming to the open house and it's just so cool to see everyone in person and not just you know send emails to people there was a lot of former and future crew that came and visited and like people that we've been communicating with and it's just i love love that community that that is created around the boats we have yeah i agree cool well uh i'm gonna miss you guys but uh i'm gonna have fun sailing this summer yeah good (laughs) (laughs) hold fast mia hold fast On the Wind is presented by our longtime friends and sponsor Forbes Horton Yachts. Forbes can buy you your dream boat, can sell your current boat, the two happiest days in a boat owner's life, buying your boat and selling your boat. Uh, He can help with all that, whether or not he's listing the boats or not. You find your dream boat somewhere else, hire Forbes to be your buyer's broker. Actually, you don't even need to hire him. He just splits the commission with the selling broker. Works very happily like that. 
Um, you can check out his listings if you're interested at Forbes Yachts. I'm going to steal August's uh, phonetic spelling. It's Foxtrot, Oscar, Romeo, Bravo, Echo, Sierra. That's ForbesYachts.com. Uh, I'm excited to see Forbes when I go back to Annapolis. And one of the things I've wanted to do for a long time, we're going to have to make this happen, is August and I love doing these boat shopping podcasts. And I would love to go on Forbes' website and do our little boat shopping about some of the listings he has. Uh, Matt, in fact, from today's episode, inspired me to rethink about that because we talk about Matt being a broker towards the end of it. But um, that's kind of beside the point. But uh, anyway, to wanna, if you want to see Forbes' listings and get a preview of maybe a potential podcast idea in the future, again, go to ForbesYachts.com. That's F-O-R-B-E-S, ForbesYachts.com. Thanks to Forbes for sponsoring the show. On the Wind is also presented by Dive Blue, who make portable tankless scuba dive systems. We have one on each of our boats, in fact. Uh, enjoy diving on your own terms with a blue tankless dive system. What is tankless diving exactly? We like to think of it as innovation. Blue's tankless diving system gives divers an opportunity to experience the beauty of the underwater world without the constant worry of having heavy scuba tanks on hand. They carry two types of tankless dive systems, the Nemo system for tankless diving up to 10 feet and the Nomad system, which is what we have on Falcon and Eastbjorn, for depths up to 30 feet. For us, it's not just about having fun. It allows us to clean the bottom of the boats, fix a wrapped prop, or otherwise inspect the keel and things that you used to have to do either with heavy scuba equipment or by taking a bunch of free dive breaths. And this is uh, basically now a critical tool on both of our boats uh, in our maintenance toolkit. So anybody that's a sailor that's doing your own stuff out there, I highly recommend one of these systems. Um, the amount of money we've spent on divers over the years to clean the hull before a big passage would easily pay for a tankless scuba dive system. So check out the Nemo and Nomad dive systems at diveblue.com. That's D I V E. B L U and then the number three dot com. Thanks again to Dive Blue for sponsoring the podcast. You're listening to On the Wind, my podcast about offshore sailing. I'm your host, Andy Shell. Celeste Pomerantz wasn't a sailor until she signed up for a sail and ski trip out of Tromsø, Norway, that was headed north in search of unskied peaks in Svalbard. The boat was called Sophie and was owned and skippered by friend of 59 North, Mats Grimseth. I discovered Celeste in the ski film Wavy 2 about the adventure and immediately reached out to her. We talked about sailing in the Arctic, her upbringing in the mountains of western British Columbia, similarities between big mountain skiing and offshore sailing, managing fear, imposter syndrome, and her studies in renewable energy. This was a bit of a different interview today as Celeste is not really a lifelong sailor, but you can learn a lot and I really enjoyed talking to her about her own adventures. Cool. Um, I always like to ask, particularly when we're not in the same place, if you want to just tell us where you are and like describe the setting. So like, where are you actually talking to us from right now? Um, I'm talking to you from my house in Squamish, British Columbia in Canada. It's like a small mountain town between Whistler and Vancouver. It's kind of perfectly in the middle. And what if you meet someone at like a stranger that has no idea who you are, if you're at a party or something, and they ask, oh, hey, what do you do for a living? How do you, how do you answer that? Um, I always start with saying that I'm a student because um, I'm currently in school. I'm doing a master's. And then I say that I'm an athlete. I'm pursuing a professional career in skiing now, um, sort of semi in mountain biking, I would say. But skiing is definitely the, the focus when it comes to sport. So this is ostensibly a sailing podcast, yeah. and the reason I, <laughs> the reason I wanted to talk to you um, is, I I, f I found out about you because I watched um, that movie Wavy Two, which was you and um, Nicola from how do you say his name? Is Nico that right? Nikolai. Nikolai, from uh, in Norway sailing up to Svalbard now, and like it struck me that you guys, or at least you, had like never been on a boat and you're doing this stretch of ocean in the Barents Sea that is like really dangerous and really <laughs> kind of off the end of the earth. And I was like, this is so cool. And and your skipper was Matt Grimseth, who is 
sort of mutual friends with me and a couple other people. It's a very the the, the ocean sailing world is a very small world. Yeah. So anyway, I'm watching this on YouTube in my living room like a f- month or a couple months ago, and I was like, shit, I gotta I gotta reach out to Celeste and ask about this because <laughs> this is like so cool. And my other, if it wasn't sailing, like I'd probably pursue a, not a pro skiing career, but we've often talked about doing sail and ski stuff, just like what you did with Matt's. So yeah. that's that's why you're on the show. But in the bigger picture, in the bigger themes, like the idea that you're pursuing a a career around something that you're really passionate about. That's like really what I'm most interested in. And then we can talk about how the sailing story kind of brought you here in the first place. But um, why don't, why don't we start there actually? What, what did you ever expect to get invited on a trip like that? And did you even know where Svalbard was? Um, I had never Honestly, being a professional skier wasn't part of the plan. Skiing has been a huge passion of mine my whole life, first as a ski racer and then moved into backcountry skiing. And I've just been doing my own thing. Um, somehow got the attention of Black Crows. And I did not expect a, tr- a trip of that caliber anytime soon or at any point in my life. Um, although skiing, so sailing to skiing was like a huge dream of mine because I actually am um, Norwegian. I'm half Norwegian. My mom's Norwegian, oh, no so way. I have a, I have a passport. I've lived there before, so I knew where Svalbard was, <laughs> but that's pretty much it. I didn't know how far it was. Um, yeah, so this was all kind of a shock when I got invited on the trip, um, but it was an immediate yes. Did so being Norwegian? Did you like grow up around boats? I mean, most Norwegians are boaters on some level. No, so I only lived in Norway for a year. Um, I was for the most part, just born in, in, not born, raised in Canada. I was actually born in the States. Um, so yeah, did not grow up around boats. I have done sailing camp and that's, that's a, that's also a really funny story because it kind of left me extremely afraid of boats because it was on those small little, like the little dinghies, you know, the little like bath the opties, the square ones in the front. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're like bathtubs. And I remember being in the boat with my sister and like crying and, feeling sick and I've always had a bad time with motion sickness and um hadn't really been on a boat since then and when I got invited on this trip I was like you know what this is how I'm going to uh face that fear of sailing because I'm not afraid of the ocean but the sailing itself I was feeling kind of vulnerable about so it was it was good I'm glad I said yes (laughs) so what was the like Walk me through like the the timeline of this and like how did how does stuff like this happen? Like it sounds like was this one of your first forays with Black Crows on and doing like a pro skiing type of thing? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I I guess I was like on the team the April before and I'd done a couple shoots with them, but nothing like all everything was at home. Um, so being invited to Svalbard was my first like serious internet. Well, I had been to to Chamonix to visit the team, but that was my first like real international like project with them. Um, so yeah, definitely like I'd never been mic'd up before for anything. Um, so like almost all of it was new to me. <laughs> well, actually the, the main reason like I reached out to you and I felt like, like I had a feeling that you would reply is that it, the, the whole film, it's very, like it's very, it seems as inaccessible as the skiing was that you were doing, like quite literally, um, it, it, it seemed really like real. Like you guys, uh, Nikolai as well, like just gave off this like kind of really authentic thing that it made, it really made you feel like you were there with you, but it also made me feel like you weren't, you guys weren't these sort of um, like mannequins for lack of a better word like it, 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 it's you seem like real people there and and some of the things you talked about with the sailing and with the skiing and some of the the way you guys talked about the challenges with skiing and Nikolai had obviously been there before and he was kind of pushing you and stuff that was really it was really cool and it made me think like oh wait maybe like maybe these are just real people um and I, and I like that what, what was that what was that was it really like that in the moment yeah it was it was completely real like there was like maybe a couple moments where we had to get certain like scenes, but they had nothing to do with like us as people. But otherwise, everything was completely real, like totally genuine. Like I got sick almost immediately. There it was. There was a lot of moments that they could have captured that would have made it even more real. And this movie could have been like two hours long, but I'm kind of glad that they cut it the way they did because there were some moments of just like like complete bottom, just like hit rock bottom when it came to 
to the sailing experience and um yeah feeling sick especially like can you describe can you describe what that i mean i know what it's like to be seasick and on a boat in a place you don't want to be can, yeah. can you describe what that's like um yeah i i mean once we got out of uh Trumsa, which is where we started from um it, like as soon as you exit the fjord it starts getting pretty wavy and uh i didn't expect waves at that caliber like it was full on like you could get thrown across the room like at nighttime like mats had set up little railings for for my bed and at one point i had like i had my earplugs in my face mask on and i just rolled and broke through the railing right onto the floor like it was that aggressive for a couple of the days and just woke up immediately feeling sick the next day. I was trying to take some drug that my dad's friend who sails recommended and it didn't work. Um, and I guess in Norway, you get these like patches you put behind your ear. And I was kind of trying to avoid it because they kept complaining about how dry their mouths were getting and like a couple other symptoms. Um, but that ended up saving me completely. Um, but that was that was after I'd already thrown up and everything. <laughs> it's so funny. You, you, that, you basically just described like, it, like almost to a T, everyone's experience that that kind of goes offshore sailing for the first time, where no matter how much, and I don't know what kind of briefings you got from Mats or anybody on what it would be like, but like no matter how much you emphasize to people that like, look, you, you don't understand how physically difficult it is just to live on the boat and just like going to the bathroom, staying in your bed, like you said, like <laughs> the level of difficulty in, in brushing your teeth, it's like the yeah. sink can be right over there. <laughs> and you're like, there's no way I can't make it. I can't, I, it's way too far. <laughs> do, do, is this resonating with you? Yes, completely. Um, it's actually reminding me of how hard cooking was on the boat. Um, I think Nicola and I, Nikolai and I, like, if it hadn't been for Oda, who's like, who was the partial owner of, of Sophie, um, if he hadn't been there, helping with the cooking. I don't know how we would have eaten those first few days because there was no way I was going like, like a, even those few steps down, I was instantly more sick because the kitchen was, I guess, like on the lower level. Um, and as soon as I would get there, I was like, I'm completely useless. Like everyone's standing like in a star shape trying to hold themselves together while we're cooking up like <laughs> a real meal. And it was like every everything was difficult which is which was actually really great it was it was a s sweet learning experience um and it was awesome once we got over the sickness what time uh what time of year did you did you leave trump so do you remember yeah so this was in may in may to june so it was it okay. was like three weeks um into like the first part of june yeah okay so we went up there in i went up there that same route i think I think maybe a few weeks later in June 20, we went up in June 2018 and spent like the month of June up there before we sailed on to Iceland. Mm -hmm. And then, so you guys were like a little, like the typical season up there, sailing season is like later than that. But I guess because you're going for skiing and it, we can talk about this, but it seems like you got pretty skunked on the, on the, on the skiing part yeah. of the adventure for the most part. Yeah, def definitely didn't expect the heat wave. Um, and neither did the locals. It was like 12 degrees Celsius every single day. Um, and everything was just melting, like things were changing overnight. Um, but night didn't matter because it was sunny at nighttime. So <laughs> it just never refroze, um, which we were kind of anticipating. But yeah, definitely with the with, with dealing with learning how to be on a boat, learning how to sleep when it's bright out, not knowing what time it is, and then being on shifts. That was a whole thing, too. It was yeah, huge learning curve. <laughs> So how did, how, two questions, one quick one. Did you ever get over that initial seasickness? Was that passage long enough that you got to the point, where I call it like the, the, the philosophical point where you're like enjoying actually being in the ocean? Yeah, uh, it took about three days, maybe four. Um, I think like just over halfway to Svalbard from Tromsø, we were feeling good. Um, and that, that was great because then we were able to enjoy like all the wildlife. We saw a ton of animals and what was actually crazy was getting back onto land in Longyearbyen, the capital in, in Svalbard. Like, your sudden, your body is like totally tuned to to the waves, and so as soon as you get on land, we all felt almost like drunk because you you feel like you're swaying a bit because the land isn't swaying, but your body still kind of is. So it was that was weird. Land sickness <laughs> had like one beer Another, and I felt super drunk, which was weird. <laughs> <laughs> another common another common complaint that's but i'm glad you said that you got over it and you said three days and that's mm -hmm. that's like the magic number it usually takes three days to be on on a passage and start enjoying it because even if you're not like super sick 
it's that acclimatization. It's like you feel like eating. You can finally sleep a little bit. Um, the daylight aside, um, that that's that's cool that that rang true with you as well. Who's not a sailor? Like that's kind of what I say to people. Like just give it three days. Give yeah. it three days. Uh, that that's cool. Um, t- so you're like your other skiing friends and stuff. I mean, sail and sail to ski sort of thing is is like a thing now. But it, is it a, it is it a thing amongst like the skiing crowd? Is this something that people aspire to do or did your friends think you were nuts? Uh, people absolutely aspire to do that. I think kind of with the rise of a lot of ski movies and social media and stuff and like, you know, blowing out a lot of incredible trips with skiing. I think that's been a dream for at least all of my professional skier friends. Um, and I'm sure for um, a lot of my other friends that don't do it professionally, but it's definitely been something that I've been thinking about for for years, even before I even considered skiing as a profession. Where did where did that inspiration come from initially? Uh, which for you for the the, the sk- uh, sail and ski, and ski thing? Yeah, like what? Um, yeah, like what inspired you to that? It must have been the year I lived in Norway. Um, I lived in Norway in twenty. I think it was twenty sixteen, seventeen. Yeah. And, um, that was kind of the first time I really went head into ski touring. Like I'd been doing it for a couple of years, but that really like nailed it in for me. Like, this is what I love to do. And this is what I want to do as much as possible. And just living in Norway, people do it. People talk about it. Um, it was already happening on social media, I guess. I'd seen ski movies with it happening. I'd probably, no, Nikolai didn't go on Wavy until like a the first wave until a few years later but anyways i was just inspired by it completely like it was definitely it's been on the list for a long time where in norway were you living i was living in a town called torvik booked it's like near molda um it's kind of like on the west coast in the middle maybe like a couple hours south of trondheim okay yeah, uh well, like, so one like of my best... area well um so the uh, now owner and skipper of the boat that I sailed to Svalbard in 2018, uh, Eastbjorn, he lives in Bergen. So the boat's based in Bergen now. So cool. we kind of have a, that, that's my Norway familiarity. Um, um, so back to like the skiing stuff. I mean, when did it become apparent that you, that this was something that you could like pursue? I know you're in school now, but like not everybody gets called by black crows to go on stuff like this. I mean, when did that become like possible in, in your, in your mind? Um, well, like I said, it wasn't really a plan, so it kind of just happened, and then I accepted it. Um, I didn't push back at all. It was, I had started getting a little bit of support uh, from a base layer company called Mons Royale, and they had a relationship with Black Crows, and they kind of got me in contact, and I wasn't, I didn't even have an athlete's portfolio. I didn't have anything yet. They were just like, send us a video of you skiing, like, tell us about some of your goals. And then I was like, damn, I feel like this could be a thing. And, um, let's just see where it goes. Like it was, it was, it seriously hasn't been a plan and I'm taking it as it comes now. Obviously I'm taking it quite a bit more seriously, but, um, up until that moment, like up until I got the email or the call being like, how do you feel about going with Nikolai Shermer to Svalbard? I was like, that's a joke. (laughs) And then once they were like, no, this is legit. Like we want you to come. Um, then I realized that there was maybe like a niche for my, the type of skiing that I do. Maybe there aren't a lot of women out there that are like pursuing more like Kuwar steep skiing type stuff. Um, yeah, I, I'm not actually sure, but it fell into place. <laughs> so if if that wasn't the plan, what was your plan? Did you have a plan? Um, I was actually in a transitionary phase of my life, which is it was perfect. It came at a really good time. I had graduated from my undergrad in 2018 and took a year off of looking for a job, just like wanted to enjoy my time in Squamish um, with skiing and mountain biking. And then couldn't find a job for my life, Um, applied for my master's, got in, didn't think I was going to get in. So I was kind of like, had just started my master's, was like halfway through it and then got this call. So it was for me, it was like a good thing that came at a time where I didn't really know what the plan was because doing my master's was just, and still is just a mean of trying to get a job. Like I'm not... (laughs) <laughs> really into being in school forever because it's not it's not the best <laughs> so what is what is the reality then of being like a i mean are, are, like do you call yourself a pro skier are you able to support yourself on that is that like a viable a viable thing um at the moment no it's not i can't just like survive with any income that i make through skiing um hopefully that's changing moving forward but 
I would, I guess I would consider myself a pro skier, but it's still weird to say it. Um, just like being able to come on these opportunities for free and getting a little bit of money is like, honestly, great. <laughs> but yeah, definitely trying to push it a bit more over the next few years. I realized I might as well milk it while I can, like try and push myself, progress as a skier, do more adventures like this and um, graduate somewhere in there, doing my master's extremely slowly like right now and and then fall back on that one day when I feel like I want to to focus on what I'm studying. Did, like when you were a kid, did you know what you wanted to do when you grow up? Uh, I wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> That was the that Me was too. yeah that That's was a good the choice. <laughs> I have uh, I have to show you this. I have in I'm in my office in Sweden. Yeah. I have the if you can see it up there the yeah. Lego loon, Lego Lunar Moon Lander, Lander yeah, that's uh, sweet. on there on my shelf. That's cool. So yeah, I also wanted to be an astronaut. And I actually I actually think that ocean sailing is the closest the closest thing to like space travel that I was going to say it makes sense that you wanted to be an astronaut cuz I feel like it's quite similar. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I like thinking that way anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so astronaut aside, I mean, what has been, what has driven, what has driven you in your life? Cause like I get, you just mentioned a couple of things now and, and the way the movie was portrayed, I get the sense that like you're more capable than you think you are. Like I, in the movie, Nikolai continually kind of pushed you yeah. and, and and that was a thing. And even just now, you you said you can't believe that these people are calling you and stuff. So like, where does that? How does that like? How does that like uncertainty jibe with the fact that like you've done a lot of very cool, successful things? Like those two things don't necessarily fit together. Yeah, I I've gotten better at being kinder to myself, um, especially since watching the movie for the first time because I wasn't part of the editing process. And he has this whole piece at the end where I'm being quite mean to myself at the end of every single line, being like, ah, oh, I could have skied that faster, like, you know, could have done it better, things like that. So since then, I've been a lot kinder to myself being like, no, like, look at what you're doing. You deserve this. You Like, don't have imposter syndrome. Um, I have it in every aspect of my life. Like getting into school, I was like, oh, my grades weren't good enough. How am I, how am I getting into my master's right now? Or like, how am I getting support for skiing? Like, things like that. But now it's now it's getting better. Now I'm being a lot kinder to myself. I'm recognizing that I do deserve to be where I'm at. And I have worked extremely hard for it. Um, so, yeah, it's just been like a bit of like a mental battle to get to where I am now. But it's it's definitely improved a lot. I mean, I think that's like the curse of, of like people that strive to do like big things because you, you, the stakes are higher. So you, you, you want to be perfect. You're never going to be perfect. And I, I have the same thing. I have the same imposter syndrome. I know exactly what you're talking about. And that's why I asked this because it is, it's that it's, you're like cursed, like the, the, and the more successful you become, the worse that feeling gets sometimes mm -hmm. because you just, you, you go for the next thing then and the stakes get higher and higher and higher. So how, like, did, did something click for you that like got you off that treadmill or, or um, what happened? It actually took me showing Wavy um, to my community in Squamish, which I was extremely nervous about. Um, there was like, I don't know, 100, 150 people there. And it was one of my best friends who she's working in, in mental health and sport and counseling right now. Like she's finishing her master's in that. And she came up to me at the end of the movie and she was like, you got to practice what you preach. Because I had talked about like not having imposter syndrome when I was presenting the movie. And she's like, you have to practice what you preach. preach. Like I, I she's a, also a professional mountain biker. So like, it was really good to have somebody like pretty much like slap me in the face, be like, work on this. And I was like, You're right, I should work on this. So yeah, that was, that was kind of the like tipping point to like, okay. Yeah. And, and how has that manifested itself now? Like, how do you talk to yourself now? What's different? Um, well, for example, I was I did a bike race two days ago, an enduro mountain bike race, and I did quite poorly. And I was doing that again. I was being really hard on myself because I just come out of ski season. and I wasn't recognizing all these things like not training properly for it and all that. And again, my friend was with me and I what clicked for me at the end of the race was was, you know, how to ride a bike, like don't let the bike ride you. And that's kind of that's kind of the mentality I had all through this season too, since the wavy movie has been out is like, you know how to ski. Don't like, if you make yourself feel small, then you'll ski small. Um, so the same goes for biking. The same goes for myself in school. Like 
just you gotta you, you just gotta say nice things to yourself even if you don't want to <laughs> It sounds like it's so silly. I mean, I, I go to a therapist once in a while pretty regularly. And yeah. like when you talk about this stuff, it sounds so simple. It's, yeah. it's just so obvious, but it's like not it's so it's hard. Just, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's really cool to talk about this. I, I talk about this theme a lot with um, with people on this show and personally. Do you know Angel Collinson? Yeah, I've actually interviewed her for a paper I did in school a few years ago. She's like my hero. Oh, really? Yeah. OK, what yeah. was the paper about? Um, it was about um, why or why not uh, snow sport athletes choose to speak out about climate change. It was like a non-biased approach to just I interviewed a bunch of different athletes um, and tried to figure out, like, is it education background? Um, is it feelings of like hypocrisy? And she released this really cool video in 2018 called Hypocrisy and Fear, where she's talking about how she's feeling silenced by the general public um, for flying a helicopter and like, she can't have a voice in the climate fight, even though obviously all snow sport athletes care about it. And I thought it was really interesting because she made a bunch of really good points about where the general public's education is also coming from. Cause a lot of time it's quite naive. Um, and I'm doing a master's pretty much on this topic. So it was really cool for me to like reach out and she actually responded and like be able to talk to a few of my other friends. And, and that was, yeah, that was my paper. It was sick. <laughs> That's all. Well, Angel, I got to know Angel because she's a sailor now, yeah, as you yeah. I guess know. She like retired from skiing and yeah. went sailing. And I got to know her. Um, I forget what the initial introduction was, but I met her a couple times and we became kind of friends. I would I still I would call her a friend, but it's like you, you meet each other in random ports. I met her in Lanzarote last time on her boat Very and cool. uh, kind of followed them when they did the thing. But like Angel and I had she's been on the podcast twice, at least twice, I think. And the first one was just me and her, and we talked a lot about, again, this was like the first episode with her was before she got into sailing, before she did any of her ocean crossings and stuff. So it was a lot focused on skiing and the similar themes. And like, it was a lot of mental health because I was going through like a really, the beginnings of a, of a pretty bad depression that I went through that I'm only just coming out of now. And Angel had so much to talk about on that front. And it's just so cool to relate to people that you look up to like angels my hero too she's awesome mm -hmm. but like the way she describes handling fear and stuff like that it's just like refreshing and it's really cool i think we're at a a good time in like culture where that it's okay to talk about this stuff now and not not only okay but it's encouraged um and, and that conversation with her i had was really enlightening on how she handles her own mental health, even though when you look at somebody like her from a distance, she's like top of the world, yeah. you know? Yeah. And uh, I just, I just, I think that's really important. I think it's cool that you're doing that. It's interesting too, with your climate change stuff, that it's like that intersection. I mean, you saw this in Svalbard between skiing and sailing. Yeah. Cause we have the same climate change issues in this, in the offshore sailing world with, you know, more violent weather, hurricanes, all the rest of this stuff that yeah. affects you guys. So what was that like in Svalbard? Like kind of seeing that firsthand? How did you, did you think about that? Has it related to your studies when you were there? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I, yeah, I thought a lot about the feelings of hypocrisy with like, we're on a boat that's running a diesel generator or fuel, whatever it's, there's fossil fuels involved. Um, I had to fly halfway across the world for this. Um, and now we're here and there's a heat wave and, it's obviously not, like, it's not me flying across the world. That's why there's a heat wave. But like, it, I definitely was having these feelings of like, this is a carbon intensive sport. And what we're doing on this trip is also quite carbon intensive. Um, but I think where people kind of don't see the, like, I'd say flying around is the greatest carbon intensive thing that you can do in your life. I don't think taking a boat, I don't think taking a snowmobile, um, maybe flying in helicopter. I don't think those things are that carbon intensive. It's kind of like a drop in the bucket compared to moving halfway across the world, for example, or flying somewhere. Um, so I'm just trying to, yeah, with, with that, it, I, I started struggling with that because at the time when I interviewed her, I wasn't skiing professionally. It wasn't even on the radar yet. Um, so I was, I guess I didn't really understand what she was talking about, even though I wrote a whole paper on it. And now I get it because now I have these feelings of anxiety and, hoping not to get backlash and like not wanting to be silenced and um, also haven't really spoken out on my social media about climate change or anything like that um, because I haven't been able to put it into the correct wording yet. So it is an interesting thing. 
Well, I mean, it's the same thing with us. Like, I, our one of our boats is currently midway across the Atlantic, and there's eleven people on it, all of whom flew to the start port in Las Palmas, mm-hmm. and it, it is one of the the huge contradictions of what we do as a business. Where, in one hand, we're like, there's no like better way than to sail across the ocean with the wind. Like, you know, it's the most inefficient means of travel in terms of like time spent. They've been at sea almost three weeks, but you have to fly, you're flying 11 people around at the beginning, at the end of each trip, 15 times a year on our passage schedule. And it's like, I mean, yeah, it's, is it hypocritical or is it like, I've, I've had a hard time thinking about this because like, yes, it's, it's hypocritical in the sense that like, we all care about the environment and we do it anyway. That's the hypocrisy. But like. I I don't know what like what's what's the answer you know right like, what, like it's a very I think vulnerable igno- question it's a very vulnerable question and um when presented to each of these individual athletes I could like feel that from all of them um and I feel it too and I know brands brands definitely feel it so it's it's a really hard one to answer and there isn't I don't really know if there's like a completely right way to do it well I think the conclusion I came to is like you have to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge the contradiction and acknowledge the hypocrisy and own it basically. Cause like if you don't do you, you, cause you can't justify it. There's no reasonable way to, to justifying it. And like, if you justify it because of the economics, well, this is my business. That's how we got here in the first place. Cause everybody justifies it for economics. So like, I, I don't know the answer either, but at least I, I feel comfortable owning the, owning the sort of, dual duality of it i guess knowing yeah. that it's bad and doing it anyway <laughs> yeah yeah i i mean i find solace in knowing that like what i'm studying in school is definitely helping the problem um the decisions i make in my day-to-day life the way i vote like having a good grasp on policy and energy policy issues like i think things like that make a much bigger impact than what the individual person's doing you know yeah what inspired you to go to school for that Um, well, I started my undergrad at the University of Calgary and I was in geology. And at first I was like, wow, rocks are really cool. And then they were like, you know, what's cooler than rocks? Oil. (laughs) And I, I don't know if this influenced me, but I'm born on Earth Day. So my whole life, like my birthday was celebrated in and around sustainability. And I've always like considered myself like a bit more of an advocate for the environment. So I was like, this doesn't go well with what I want to do with my life. So I swapped out into this incredible program that was called alternative energy. Um, Can't really call it renewables because we also studied nuclear. And I just got so excited, especially about energy storage. Um, So when I applied for my master's, um, I'm like now focusing on energy storage solutions for remote communities. And um, some of the required courses I had to take involved this one paper I did with with, uh, Angel. And um, yeah, it's just kind of always been on my radar. It's been something I've cared about my whole life. So it's nice to be hopefully pursuing a career one day in that field. The energy storage that I mean, that's like that's you're talking my language now because that's like what we deal with on the boat because we're yeah. like going back to the astronaut thing. We're this little we're this little autonomous, you know, spaceship that has to produce its own electricity, produce yeah. its own water. And, and all the rest. And um, it, it's been really fascinating. The 20 years I've been sort of a professional sailor, um, it's how far they've come, we've come in like energy generation and energy storage. So we have lithium batteries on the big boat that's at sea now and a hydro generator. And they've sailed 3,000 miles across the Atlantic and haven't had to start the engine once. That's incredible. Because they're making all their energy through the... As long as the boat's moving... They're making energy from the hydro and storing it in the lithium. It's it's pretty. You can do some pretty cool stuff. That's really rad. Yeah, I think the issue with energy storage right now is is how big lithium is, like how big those batteries are, how heavy they are, um, kind of the energy intensity to like make one of those batteries and mine for the materials. So I'm like really focused on all of the energy storage possibilities, and I'm trying to look at potentially which might be better in the long run. Um, whether that's like economically more feasible or if it's just more sustainable to have. Um, so I'm kind of looking at all of them because, yeah, it's it's an interesting problem, the energy storage problem. And I don't know if it's talked about enough. I think it, it's gaining traction now, but it's it's cool to see like people using it in their boats, um, communities considering it, mines considering it, things like that. 
the mining thing I was going to bring up, <coughs> I, I read an article about this, how, how they're using like mines as like a, as a analog battery where like you're using surplus energy to, to bring a heavy weight to the top of the mine shaft. Mm-hmm. And then as that weight falls back down again, it's running a turbine that's creating energy on the descent. And it's like such, it's like the simplest thing it's of so all. so easy. And yeah. It's so cool though. Yeah. How you, like how they're, how they're doing that. So is that, that the kind of thing you're like studying? Um, it's not so much like the mechanics of it since I'm, um, it's more of like applied science. So I'm focusing okay. specifically on like the remote communities in Northern Canada. And I'm just trying to see based on like their limitations. So like most of them are flying communities, they're indigenous, maybe they don't have access to that much funding, um, but they have a ton of natural resources available to them. And I'm just trying to see like what type of energy storage will best suit their needs um, for small communities like that. But I'm, I'm hoping to write a, like a chapter on some mines or um, even like a heli ski operation, something small. Um, I think that could be that could be really cool. But yeah, less less on the mechanics, more on the like the ver- like the variability in energy storage. It's um it's it's ironic that you're Norwegian as well because Norway is probably the biggest hypocrite of all when it yeah. comes to like energy stuff. I uh, know. Right? The I was whole country. Say that. <laughs> their whole country runs on like pure you know renewables, and yet they export like the world's oil. It's um yeah. it's a it's a it's a weird dynamic. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, they wouldn't be where they are now. Like, they wouldn't be one of the more wealthy countries in the world if it hadn't been for their oil economy. Um, so that kind of helped them with the green transition, I guess you could say. Um, I think where I'm, like, a little bit disappointed is is their lack of moving away from the oil and gas industry now that they do have the resources to to kind of transition to a, to a completely green economy and their hydro capabilities are insane. Um, and they have done a lot of really cool stuff when it comes to policy and electric vehicles, for example, and and like rebates on that. But um, at the same time, they're not dialing back their their oil. So they're, yeah, it's mm. it's also a double edged sword with Norway. So you were born in the U.S. Yeah, you lived in you live in Canada, and you were Norwegian. So do you have a U.S. passport as well? Yeah, I have three. So how do you what like what do you most identify? A Canadian. How do you most identify? Canadian. Canadian. Yeah. Um, Because you were raised there. Yeah. We moved here in 2001 and um, we bopped around a bit out of Canada between then and now. But um, yeah, pretty much been here the whole time. So what are what is your family and and like parents and stuff think about your lifestyle? Um, I think at first they were unsure. Um, But, you know, both my parents have always been huge advocates for the sports I've been doing, like since I was a kid. I like I ski raced like I, and as soon as I quit ski racing I kind of freaked out and joined all the sports teams at school even though I'd never done like team sports before <laughs> um and immediately like launched myself into backcountry skiing so they've always known me to be like very driven with sports so I don't think they were like overly surprised when I started getting these opportunities but I think they were also like what does this mean for your future like make sure you focus on getting a real grown up job and all this stuff so I think now they're just coming around to they're stoked, but I think I think they'd be more stoked if I would like graduate already. <laughs> what did your what's like what did when you were growing up, what did your parents do for a living? Um my dad kind of had a, a few different jobs. Um he's owned a couple of little companies here and there, but now he's got a um like a small software company. Um and my mom had three kids in the span of eighteen months. So her life was pretty much just spent taking care of us which was incredible she's a hero Um, seriously i have one kid and i can't handle one kid that's (laughs) amazing yeah yeah they they had a lot their three girls in 18 months was a lot so so bouncing around here back to the small bar trip um did you know did you know like who nikolai was before you got invited along yeah of course um he's kind of like in norway at least like he's kind of like a ski legend or like becoming one you could say. So everyone was like pretty big fans of him. Everyone really, a lot of like the guys that I was skiing with when I was in Norway, they really were like, we got to ski like Nikolai. We got to straight line all the cool wires, all this stuff. Um, and yeah, I just, I kind of like, I knew who he was. I watched some of his YouTube videos. I wasn't like a hardcore follower just cause I don't really watch that much YouTube, but then, um, yeah, meeting him for the first time. I was, I was like, I wasn't sure if he was going to be real, like if he was going to be fake and he was like totally candid, like totally good dude 
the way he is in his videos is how he is in real life pretty much so it was it was really nice to to actually meet him did he pick you or how did that all come together like did black crows pick you and gave you to him or did he (laughs) was this his trip like how did how did the whole thing get organized i think he had like a choice to bring a teammate from black crows um and i think they just really wanted a female on the trip um and they were like I think there was like a couple of us he could choose between and then I got chosen somehow. I, don't, I haven't, like I asked him once, I was like, why me? <laughs> um, before the trip. And he was like, because you like to do what what we're trying to do on this trip. So yeah, um, I think he was definitely nervous though because he had never seen me ski before. I think you saw in the video, he saw that, that like one video of me falling down a mountain. Um, and that was on my very first day shooting with Black Rose ever. So <laughs> yeah, he didn't, I, I, I'm glad there was trust um because that was great so what did you what did you learn from a trip like that um both as a skier and as a person um for skiing I mean we were skiing stuff that I love to ski like I've never really been the one to care if the conditions are shitty so like for me the snow quality although terrible was still slushy and it's fun so it was super fun I think maybe what I learned was more about slough management because I haven't really dealt with too much of that in my life yet. And, uh, getting like slushed out was like the first, that's a, that was a first for me in a cool Like I, I know how to deal with slough. So can you explain, can you explain what that means? Yeah. So sl- first of all, like, like go even way back. Like what is cooler skiing and okay. like, what's the, get technical here. Yeah. This is cool. Okay. So a cool is like, um, usually starting from like the summit of a mountain, it's like a, a, a steep, narrow passageway between two, rock walls typically um and they could be anywhere between like 40 and as steep as you want um i'd say like the average couloir if you're like trying to be gnarly would be like 55 degrees 50 degrees that's like that's like jump turns or if you're nikolai just straight line it (laughs) um and they can be as wide or as narrow they can be as narrow as your skis are long they can be narrower than that they can be multiple ski widths wide so they they really vary in shape and size so that's a cool um and that was kind of like that was like the big line we got at the end and then slough is kind of this like first layer of snow that comes off when you've had a fresh snow um and a lot of skiers when you're skiing really steep stuff especially over a big face you kind of have to like to traverse through the mountain as you're skiing down it to avoid it um and then slush is that what kind of looks like when you're when you're watching like a ski movie it almost looks like an avalanche, but yes. not quite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's almost like an avalanche, and it has the power to take you out, and it has the power to bury you. It's not quite as aggressive as as an avalanche, but if you're in a precarious spot with a lot of um, um, exposure, it can be really dangerous. So that's definitely something you, you have to learn how to mitigate, and I'm still learning how to do that because – out, especially here in Canada, like if you want to get into that type of terrain, you need to have a snowmobile and I do not have a snowmobile. So it's it's definitely like a learning experience for me. But in Kuwars, it's always been something I've been pretty good at managing. And in Svalbard, there's no slough there because it hadn't snowed and I didn't expect a slush, like to be slushed out. So slush is like once it started melting, it's like um, literally like a slushy and it's super heavy. So it just started collecting behind my skis in that in that last cool wire there and just like completely like took me off my feet um and i guess it would have taken skiing more like nikolai to do it right <laughs> <laughs> and is that was that in the scene where you basically like walked back up and yeah and and, and went for it again so what like how do you how do you how do you, what's the self-talk like in that moment where you're like shit i messed this up but i'm gonna do it again anyway well i didn't do the same one again so i did the one next to it which was a little bit wider but there's a few reasons why I didn't do it again Uh, first of all I was scared so I had the whole entire time that I was walking back up to think about how scary that was because I'd locked out my skis and in ski touring language like when you lock out your toes that means your skis are not coming off your feet um and if that's the case like if you eat shit and if you eat shit hard you're breaking a leg or you're twisting a knee and I'm just super thankful that neither of those things happened because I was able to kind of get out of that Um, so I had the whole walk up to think about how scary that was. My poles were gone. And then, so scary, so sorry, scary as in like you were scared of getting injured. What, what was, what was the source of the fear? So when I was 
falling, like when this left had taken me out, it was like pushing on my ski, but my ski wasn't coming off and I could feel my like shin bone starting to like bend almost. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so scary. And I like managed to like lift my skis up and over and like get out of it. Um, so I was just like shaken up a little bit. Um, and I think it was also the nerves because people were saying this could have been a first descent, I think, especially by a female. And I was really excited. And when I saw the line, like I was so, so excited. And Nikolai was like, "We, I want you to go first. You're clearly like way more stoked than I am on this. Like, just you get it. It's going to be yours, um, which was I thought that was really special. Um, but I think it was just like realizing that I'd screwed up and was like still in that like kind of imposter syndrome headspace and then walking all the way back up and thinking about what I'd done. Like, oh, should I have gone slower? Should I have gone faster? Like, what should I have done? And then getting up there, I'd already decided I wanted Nikolai to just do it. And then he did it. And I was like, okay, I'm not doing that now. (laughs) (laughs) He kind of like, he made it look good, but he like, kind of like took a lot of the snow out of it. And I was like, I just need to go ski this other line with, with uh, Osbjorn. And it ended up being a sweet line anyways. Um, not as narrow, but probably almost about as steep and still great. <laughs> uh, and that was, when, was that where you guys hiked out of Neolasund, the little village yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah. That's the day we Cause I remember seeing that part. We, we were there for um, midsummer in 2018. They have like a little midsummer, the little bar there. They oh. closed. The, did you go yeah. into the, did you get to go into the little bar there where they closed <laughs> their drapes and stuff? Yes. Yeah. That was so cool. We got there like on the Saturday or whatever day of the week it is that they party. Yeah. One day a week. Yeah. yeah. And um, there was like no phones allowed, no cameras allowed, no shoes allowed, which I thought was really fun. Cause everyone and all the drinks tasted the same. It's either you got a beer and then whatever mix you got, it was going to always taste the same. It didn't matter how you ordered it. <laughs> so that was pretty dangerous and it was cheap too. So I was, that was a really fun night. Yeah. Yeah. But I was, I, I remember like being there and like the whole time we're in Svalbard. Cause like all of us that were on the boat are also skiers to some level yeah. Yeah. and just you're, you're sailing up the coast and we went way up around the top and you just like, I mean, everywhere you look, it's just like, that looks awesome. That looks awesome. That yeah. looks awesome. And we didn't have any equipment. We couldn't do it. But mm-hmm. like the fact that you got, I was, I was very jealous of the fact that you guys are like, that looks awesome. Okay, let's go do it. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was kind of a shock to all of us. We, when we landed and or arrived in the soon, we were kind of bummed out because it had been pretty medium out there and um, everyone kept telling us to go North and the farther North we went, the worse it got. Um, and we had just left this one fjord that I'm still super choked that we didn't stay in longer because there was some lines in there that looked like they probably stayed good. Um, but we, as soon as we got out of the boat and like looked up, there was just like this towering mountain behind the Olesun with like clear kuwars. And like all of us got so excited, but we had to wait for the weather window. So that gave us time to go party and like have a full day of chilling and eating candy. And then, <laughs> and then we went the next day. <laughs> So did Matt's come along with you guys or did he stay on the boat the whole time? He came with us on the first ski tour. Um, so that was before Osbjorn met us in Longyearbyen. So we like stopped in one of the fjords before Longyearbyen. Um, and he, yeah, he just came out of safety. He was checking for bears, looking around. I think he had a good day. I don't think he'd been touring in a while. So it was really cool to have him there. Um, but otherwise he was just on the boat being, being, being yeah. point of contact. Did you, did you guys see any polar bears? Yes, we saw I I don't know six or seven, but we wow, never got awesome. close. We never got like that close to any of them. The first one we saw was actually like in the middle of Mott's doing the polar bear demonstration, like what to do when you see one. And I was about Convenient. to shoot it. I was about to shoot a flare gun for the first time in my life because he was like, "You need to feel what it feels like to shoot a flare gun." And oh, he was like about to hand me the gun, and he like looks over, and they show this in the movie, and it's completely real, like. There's a polar bear like maybe two kilometers out and his eyes, I don't know how he saw it. It took us all like the rest of us, like five minutes to see it. Um, But he had us back on the boat like pretty quickly after that happened. Um, And we just watched it from the boat. And then we saw a few from the boat kind of like on land. We saw some cubs. Um, The filmers got to see more because they would like go out in the dinghy and like go around a corner and see them. But the rest of us on the boat, like it was always too shallow. So we didn't we just saw the footage after um Matthias one of the filmmakers on his night shift one swam right next to the boat and swam by so he got to see that which was really cool night shift in air quotes <laughs> yeah daytime <laughs> daytime night shift <laughs> yeah um 
so did you guys carry like what did what did you carry with you i mean that like ski tour out of new york sun you guys were like that was a hike like did you carry bear protection with you on there what was the plan um so for those of us that have our like gun license so that was just osbjorn and matthias they would like one was in the front one was in the back um so they would have their guns so it was like Osborne had like a regular gun. It looked light. And then he also had a flare gun. And then Matias had to rent one in Longyearbyen. And the ones they rent there, you probably know this, are from World I War II. know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, they're yes. from World War II. They're like old, super heavy wooden guns. Um, and so he had to carry that with his camera bag and the flare gun. Like it was, uh, well, I guess, you uh, know, at one point he let um, – uh, Nikolai and I carry the flare gun for a bit. Just, I think it just made us feel pretty cool. But I, I don't know if I would have like <laughs> that, shot. That it. is the one thing. Like going going back and looking at the photos from when we were in Svalbard. Like all the pictures. Like someone's got a rifle on their yeah. back. It just like makes it makes you look cool. Yeah, <laughs> which yeah. is so silly. But yeah, but I'm I, the, super we, glad I have there pretty, wasn't anything. Like no, I have a pretty instance. funny. I have a pretty funny gun story when we went up there. Um, in fact, this is how we met August, who is now the skipper for East Bjorn and like a partner in our sailing business. But he through the podcast got in touch with me before uh, Spitsbergen. And I was saying how, cause, cause we did the same thing. We went from Tromso and stopped in those fjords to the South, but you need a rifle to go ashore. And because we weren't going back to Tromso, we were going on to Iceland. Yeah. We like, we couldn't rent one in Tromso cause we wouldn't get it back. And we couldn't rent one in long year because we wanted to go ashore beforehand. So I'm talking about this and August is like, he reached out and he's like, Hey, like I have a World War II rifle. Like you could, you could borrow it. And I was, and he's like, I'm. And he was, he was sailing uh, actually as what like Matt's does, doing ski and sail trips as a skipper for a different company up in Svalbard. He's like, you can borrow it, and and then I'll pick it up from you in Long Bin later when I'm up there. So he put it on the. He lives in Bergen. He put it on the Hutegruten like cruise ship <laughs> as cargo in a case yeah. and sent it up to Tromso. And then I went down to the cruise ship depot when we got into Tromso, and I was like. Hey, there's a package here for me. And the guy's like, oh, yeah. And it was like all chained up. <laughs> the guy that gave it to me is joking. It's like, oh, next stop to the bank, huh? I was like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And then, and then when we got up to Svalbard, I wish we would have done this. We didn't. But we had an idea for a brief moment because we weren't going to cross paths with August. He's like, just bury it in the sand on a beach somewhere and give me the coordinates and I'll make a treasure hunt out of it with my next crew. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's so funny. And that's Did you like do that? my biggest regret. No, that's my oh. biggest regret from that whole summer is that yeah. we didn't do that. It would have been so cool. Yeah, that would have been sweet. That's funny. But um, so you guys, th- did you sail back then after the trip back to Tromso? No, um, we, uh, Nikolai and I and Matthias flew back because we were on the, the initial trip there. And then yep. uh, Yunas, the other filmmaker, and his actually his girlfriend came up to Long Yerby and they got to do it back. So that was nice. Oh, sweet. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do you consider yourself a sailor now? No, but I, I feel... I mean, you kind, of, you kind of are. I feel better equipped. Um, I didn't really... Definitely going into this trip, I didn't realize crossing the Barents Sea is like a big thing in sailing. Um, and Mots, like, I didn't know until we got there. And Mots was like, I had to train for this. Like, it was like a whole thing for me to do this. And we met another sailor who was like, I threw up the whole way, like almost every time. And so that made me pretty nervous. I was like, oh, shit, this is like, this is like real sail, like real sailing. <laughs> but it's very I- cool that you did it's very cool that you did that and because you can just like fly as you know you can fly into long Yerbian and do a ski and sail trip from there but like it's almost like the same idea as backcountry skiing like you had to earn that you earned it by sailing there yeah um i feel better equipped um as for like my rope skills don't know if i remember many of those um mots really tried to get me to learn the skills in norwegian which was hard because <laughs> i have like a pretty minimal um like Norwegian vocabulary. So it was, it was actually really fun, but I don't think I was able to like let it stick in my head as well. Um, yeah, but yeah, definitely feeling better equipped. If someone were to invite me on another sailing trip, I'd be a hundred percent in and hopefully could be an okay, like coast skipper or something. I don't know. <laughs> careful, careful what you say. Cause I'm probably going to send you an email inviting you on another sailing trip at that'd some be point so, here because that'd be really cool. <laughs> yeah, be we'll, we'll have to work it in. We're actually do, we're doing our first, uh, so, to bring this full circle, we're mm-hmm. finally, after years of talking about it, doing our first ski and sail trips commercially on yeah. East Bjorn, which is in Bergen, up in um, up in Lingen, up north of, not in Svalbard, but north of Tromso uh, next summer. 
so or spring next april cool. i guess Okay, cool. Yeah, so that's that's very exciting. Although I'm not I'm not going to be on that first one um, at the moment, but we'll see see if I can change that. Um, cool. Well, Celeste, this has been really cool to chat. I mean, I I, I didn't expect we go down the uh, um, environmental rabbit hole, but like it was really fun talking about that stuff too. And it, it sounds like you're super passionate. And like I think it's to just re acknowledge that sort of contradiction that is it, it baked into the sports that we're both doing. Uh, I think that's important. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's a, it's a topic of conversation that comes up in my life almost every day, so I wasn't really surprised. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, um I, I guess we'll wrap this up here. I, I like I said I have a million more things I could ask you, but I, I think the next time we'll we'll have to we'll have to get you out sailing on one of our boats and uh and get you to cross an ocean next time. That would be so cool. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And I'll train more for it too. <laughs> um Awesome. Well, thanks for doing this. I'll um I'll send you some info, and you can when we're done here, you can send me the recording, and mm-hmm. then uh, I'll let you know when this is going to publish. It'll be a couple weeks. Um, it won't be right away, but I'll let you know, and I'll get I'll try to I'll get some pictures from you if I can from the Svalbard trip, especially. Sure. Yeah, of course. Um, cool. I'll, I'll just have to ask one of the guys for permission, but I'm sure it's completely fine. Yeah. Cool. But yeah, thank you cool. so much for having me. This was this was great. I was like a little nervous. I was like, I don't have that much input about sailing, but. Um, yeah. Yeah, but that's the secret. This, show, this, it's not a say like, Austin, like I said, this, it's a a podcast about sailing, but it's it's not really. It's like yeah. it's about the deeper themes. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you were great. This was great. Thank you. Cool. All right. Talk to you next time. Thanks, okay. Celeste. Bye. Thanks again to Forbes for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you want to buy your dream boat or sell your current boat. Go to ForbesYachts.com. That's Foxtrot, Oscar, Romeo, Bravo, Echo, Sierra, ForbesYachts.com. Thanks again to Dive Blue for presenting this episode of the podcast. Go to DiveBlue.com. That's D-I-V-E-B-L-U and the number three to check out the Nemo and Nomad tankless dive systems and never hold your breath to fix a wrapped prop again. On the Wind is the podcast about sailing, created by 59 North and hosted by me, Andy Shell, and guest hosted by Nikki Henderson, August Sandberg, and Emma Garshagen. The show is mixed and produced in Frederick, Maryland by our own Lee Cumberland. Episode artwork and website show notes are created by Laura Parent out in San Francisco. The intro theme music is composed and performed by former podcast guest, sailor, and musician Cameron Dale, while the outro music you're hearing right now is, of course, by our friends Storm Weather Shanty Choir out of Bergen, Norway. We love hearing from our fans, so send your questions and comments to holdfast at 59-north.com, and please do us a favor and review the show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, hold fast. I made up me mind that I was inclined to go to sea no more. No more, no more to go to sea no more. I made up me mind that I was inclined. As I was walking down the street, I met sweet Angeline. She said, come home with me, me lad, and we'll have a cracking time. But when I awoke, it was no joke, I found I was all alone. My silver watch and my money too And my whole bloody gear was gone Was gone, was gone My whole bloody gear was gone It was when I awoke it was no joke For my whole bloody gear was gone 
As I was walking down the street, I met Big Rapper Brown. I asked him if he would take me in and he looked at me with a frown. He said, last time you was paid off with me, you talked up no score. But I'll take your advance and I'll give you a chance to go and to see once more. Once more, once more, to go to see once more. I'll take your advance and I'll give you a chance to go to see once more. Sometimes we're catching whales, me lads, but mostly we get none. With a twenty foot oar in every pour from five o'clock in the morn. And when daylight's gone and the night's coming on, we rest upon our oars. And oh boys, you wish that you was dead or snug with the girls ashore. Ashore, ashore, or snug with the girls ashore. Oh, boys, you wish that you was dead, or snug with the girls ashore. Come all you seafaring lads that listen to me song. When you go a big boating, boys, make sure you do not go wrong. You take my tip when you come off a trip, don't go with any horse. But get married instead and have all night in bed and go to sea no more. No more, no more, to go to see no more. Get married instead and have all night in bed and go to see no more. No more, no more, to go to see no more. Get married instead and have all night in bed and go to see no more.